Hello everyone and welcome to our podcast series in the classical political economy tradition by the Vincent Center for the Public Understanding of Economics and Entrepreneurship at the University of Buckingham. The Vincent Center runs a series of programs in economics and related fields designed to promote a wider understanding of classical liberal economics and how markets, trade and entrepreneurship promote welfare in a free society. I'm Dr. Juan Castañeda, director of the Vincent Center, and today we'll be hosting Peter Schwartz. Peter Schwartz is a scholar at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., fellow of the Institute of Economic Affairs in London, and professor at the University Camilo José Cela in Madrid, in Spain. Pedro has previously held positions at the Research Department of the Bank of Spain and the Research Center Fundesco in Madrid. He has been a professor of economics at three Spanish universities and served as a member of the Spanish Chamber of Deputies from 1982 to 1986. He is also the vice president of the Spanish think tank Civismo in Madrid, and he has been president of the Montplan Society, of which he has been a member since 1977. Pedro obtained his doctorate in political science from the London School of Economics, where he studied under Lyron Robbins and Karl Popper. Today, we will discuss the School of Salamanca with Professor Pedro Schwartz. Pedro, it's a pleasure to have you with us. You have studied the School of Salamanca and its contributions to money and inflation, interest rates, trade, and how markets work. Could you give us a general introduction to the school, made by different authors over two centuries? What really unifies all these authors and topics under this denomination? They were all scholastics. The, this, <coughs> this is the um, <coughs> philosophy of the Middle Ages and the Catholic school, Catholic church. And these, um, these students were not all of the same views. They had different opinions and in fact clashed. Uh, what uh, the, the starting date is really St. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century. <clears throat> they were all influenced by Thomas Aquinas. <clears throat> and then they went on to study the economy of Spain and the economy of Latin America today. The, we call them the Indies, <clears throat> not the Latin not Latin America. Now, precisely, I should say that the school starts when the uh, Spain, or uh, really Castilla, realize that they have a new empire, because uh, it was a huge um, empire that in the end, <clears throat> in the 18th century, went from California down to the Terra del Fuego at the bottom of uh, Chile and Argentina. This was a very, very large uh, empire <clears throat> and it influenced the economy <clears throat> of, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it influenced the economy of Spain because uh, we in, in Castile, that is in Europe, uh, sent over goods to Latin America. Uh, those goods were purchased in Europe, in the rest of Europe, especially Flanders, which by that time in the 16th century was uh, a, a, belonged to the Spanish crown. And so we sent these goods to Latin America, to the Indies, and then they sent us back silver. And the influence of the amount of silver that entered Europe through Castile had an influence certainly on how the economy developed in the 17th and 18th century. So the background is the Indies were conquered by Castilians and a, a system of uh, trade was developed. By the way, trade monopolized in the, in the city of Cadiz or Cadiz, as we say, and uh, this monopoly was something that later in the 18th century economists, <coughs> economists criticized. And so, but during the time of the School of Salamanca, as we say, during that time, what you had is a, a fleet system 
uh, the, those fleets brought silver to Seville. Seville brought goods in uh, Flanders, in today's Belgium, and they also bought uh, Spanish oil and, uh, and um, strong liquor, and so on, set it over there. In fact, seeing this, how small this, the ships were, where do you think that all the horses that we have in America, especially the horses in the far west, they mm -hmm. all came <laughs> from the couples of the horses that they uh, that they sent over in in those small ships. So it's really incredible what how how people were able to overcome the difficulties of transport. Now <clears throat> the. Spanish philosophy or the Spanish thought in general, in the, in the case of theology, also in the case of international, of international powers and international law, and finally in economics, were, were all influenced by the fact that A, there was this trade with the rest of Europe, and also trade with Latin America. <clears throat> and these friars, there were friars in different schools, uh, Dominicans, uh, they, they were also Jesuits, some of them. These friars started to um, try to solve the moral problems that people in that trade and also the kings of Spain had because of this big empire that they had conquered. And so the, the friars not only looked back at their classical books, such as St. Thomas Aquinas, they also went down to the port and discussed with, with the people what sort of things, uh, what sort of behavior was moral. And they wrote books on this. Well, there, there was discussion on the monopoly, uh, the monopoly of trade. <clears throat> there were discussions also on whether whether the merchants could get a profit, whether that was moral, and also uh, as to what the effect of the new amount of currency coming in from the mines in the Indies, what the effect that had on prices in Castile and then in the rest of Europe. So much so that some people uh, have said that there was an inflation, or shown that there was an inflation due to the silver co coming over. To the Indies. <clears throat> so the background is that, and then there was a development in a number of things. One, a financial development. That financial development took place in the fairs that you had in Spain, in Castile. Uh, those fairs uh, had lots of connection with what today is Belgium, and also there was a problem of could you make a profit on financial trade, on financial uh, affairs? And that was discussed by these friars. So the payment of interest? Not really payment of interest, but also uh, the exchange of currencies. Because when you exchange currencies, you can make a profit uh, by having a, a, a little a percentage of the, of the trade. So uh, this is a background. The background is Fairs, it's the triangular trade going from Castile to the Indies and then to Belgium. Slavery was also an important thing because uh, the people in the Indies imported slaves, black slaves that had been wrongfully caught in Africa, by <coughs> mainly by uh, Portuguese and other traders, and so the connection of Europe with America was very intense. And that, of course, posed economic problems that these friars, imagine friars, they, they should be in their churches. Well, what did they do in going down to the ports and asking the, the merchants, what they, and they merchants asking them what was moral? So this is the background for the development of a school which we call the, the Second Scholastics, but also uh, the School of Salamanca, who tried to apply 
their theological knowledge to the new developments in trade, in finances, in taxes, because the, king, the kings of Spain had lots of wars in Europe and they needed the, that money. So these friars started to see, to try and understand how it worked and also saying something about the morality of this new, these new trends. And they were also very much interested in investigating what it could be the, the theory of value, the theory of value in, in economics. <coughs> Indeed, they were we're very say something innovative, weren't on they? It. There, there was that, yes, because prices were going up, mm -hmm. not only because of the silver coming from the Indies, from America, but also there was some inflation in Europe before um, uh, Christopher Columbus discovered uh, uh, discovered America, uh, and so the prices prices going up <coughs> was something they had to face. For example, <coughs> an economist called Aspilqueta wrote a book for confessors mm. in uh, uh, in 1556, and in that book of confessors he had an addition, an appendix on exchanges and prices. The problem was, they said, they went to the confessional or people who, who traded in all that, and they said, I confess that I sold a house for more than I paid for. And so Aspilqueta, who wrote this book in 56, said, you, what he would say today, take account of inflation. <laughs> what he said, look, prices have been going up, so part of the gain that you have is not real gain, it's gain in, in, in monetary uh, so it value. Was, it was very much a distinction between nominal and real terms. They made it very clear, that distinction. And therefore, if you, if you put the price of a house up because all prices were going up, then you didn't sin. Uh, and because they went there to say, uh, Father, I, uh, have I committed a sin? And uh, the fathers took into account the economics of the price system and, and said, uh, you have committed a, a smaller sin than you think. <laughs> In a more detailed one, if you like, the, the, the anticipated, the, the, the rational expectation theory. <laughs> These friars uh, not only prayed, uh, <laughs> but also went to the port to see how these trades were made and discuss uh, the, the system of currency and discuss taxes. And so curiously enough, here we have uh, some fr friars, uh, some intellectuals taking account, taking economics in account because they needed it for ethics. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's how economic thought started in uh, Castile, these discussions uh, by these friars who confessed, who uh, heard the confessions of the traders, and then on that they built a subsidiary, a subsidiary theory, which was uh, in many parts an advance on what was done, what was thought of in medieval Spain. Mm -hmm. Marjorie Grace Hutchinson's book on the School of Salamanca, Readings in Spanish Monetary Theory, 1544-1605, popularized the name of the school among the English-speaking world in 1952. I understand that decades later, Frederick Hayek, in a Montpellier society in Salamanca, no less, praised the school as a precursor of a free market tradition in Amesmith Smith or the Austrian School of Economics. Well, certainly, uh, Adam Smith and Hutchison at the time in the 18th, in the 18th century uh, were influenced by the thought that came from these friars of the 16th century because what they said on economics and what they said on politics was then taken up by thinkers in France and in Germany and that communicated itself with the classical economists of, of uh, Scotland and then, and then England. I say Scotland because we know Adam Smith uh, was Scottish and therefore uh, there was a tradition of economic analysis that went from uh, 16th century Castile through some Protestant thinkers 
and then to the thinkers in Scotland and in England, such as uh, Adam Smith and David Hume. And this is what interested Hayek. And he tried to rescue uh, the, uh, the name, the good name of these uh, religious people, uh, and saying economics started earlier than you thought, started earlier than Adam Smith, of course, and started earlier than the thought, and we had all these people, we call them the School of Salamanca. Uh, well, he took the name from, uh, from another historian, the School of Salamanca, because Salamanca was a very, very well-known university, um, founded before, uh, uh, before Oxford and Cambridge. And uh, many people knew about Salamanca. So these friars were not all from Salamanca, didn't all study there. They went to Paris, they went to Rome, to Lisbon, to Coimbra. And therefore, by calling them with a single name, what he did was uh, give an impression of a community of, an, of economic analysis all over the Catholic Europe. And what was the role given uh, to, to markets and property rights in this school for the development of society? Well, indeed, um, property rights were respected. And this comes from Aquinas and others that you had a right to your property and even the king couldn't come in and take it away from you. Uh, and uh, the, the right to property was, is an important element in a market economy because it allows people to make trades without fearing that somebody will diddle them or that the sovereign will take it away from them. So that, the, part, the part of property came from medieval thought but was taken up by these friars of the school of Salamanca, if I may use this, though it's a bit uh, impressionistic to call it Salamanca. By the way, uh, people should go and see Salamanca. It's a beautiful city. Uh, it's a beautiful city and build, built on silver, on the silver that came over. In fact, one of, the, uh, one of these friars wrote six books uh, on uh, the theology of, of economics and with the money he made in selling his books, built a staircase in the Dominican school, the Dominican college. So uh, the connection between Salamanca, a wonderful city, beautiful colored um, stones, and a very, very good uh, Renaissance, of, uh, Renaissance architecture. Uh, you ought to go and see Salamanca, and as Hayek did, speak from the same rostrum, from the same chair that these friars used to teach the students that went there. So um, even if it's a bit of exaggeration of saying school or Salamanca, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a good name <laughs> and is. go and see it. It is indeed. Well, I didn't say anything about prices uh -huh. because, uh, of course, uh, prices were studied because uh, they gave rise to profit. And some people were called profiteers uh, because they put prices up to try and get the difference from what they paid for their uh, for the things they bought. Sorry, Pedro, so, that sounds very modern now with the, the oh, current indeed. inflation episode. People like well, some a, people are claiming that it's just people taking advantage of it. Well, that was one thing, and then prices in the Indies in America were very much higher yeah. because those boats were very small. And so you could take some, uh, you could take some oil, you could take aqua pizza and, and so on over there, and lovely, uh, lovely silk from uh, Belgium, where they feed, and that was taken over to the Indies, and there it fetched prices. My goodness, they did fetch fetch prices, and therefore they had to discuss how prices form, and they they began by by the time of um, a gentleman of Friar called Molina, they had it very clear when a price was uh, legal. He said, when there are many traders and there's competition, prices move like the wind, up and down. Mm -hmm. And so the idea, uh, the idea that prices uh, moved and informed people on where to trade and how to trade, and also they moved because 
there was a demand for the goods. This they made it very clear that it was demand that governed prices, though of course the cost of, uh, of production was in it. But the question was, they saw that the, um, that the preferences of the buyers were the ones that really moved the prices. They say, as long as you have many traders and there's no violence, uh, and that uh, was really meant to in competition, violence, and also there was no, uh, people weren't diddled. You spoke clearly about what you were selling. And this definition of prices, I think, is one of the things that went over into uh, the economics of Europe. Uh, and, and therefore, this is one of the uh, contributions of the scholars of Salamanca to economic, uh, to economic uh, uh, analysis. But that sounds, again, very, very modern, because it's, it's a subjective uh, theory of, of value, uh, driven by demand and uh, people's uh, preferences uh, driving the markets. So as long as the market was uh, 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 governed, as if it were, by multiple uh, uh, people offering their goods and services mm -hmm. in the market, uh, open, free markets, if you like, that would make prices uh, just, right? Mercado said, uh, is another of these flyers, by the way, Mercado was born in Mexico and died in the ship that took him back to Mexico. And uh, what he said is he who said, prices move like the wind. Uh, and therefore, you didn't have prices as you had in closed economies that for years were more or less the same, unless there was a famine or something. So here they started seeing that prices change according to trade and according to preferences. And that is a founding stone of economic analysis. One thing that we have to take into account is they said, yeah, well, prices, free prices are all right, but if the king says this is a price for it, then it's much better because then we don't have movements in prices. So, yes, people say uh, they, set, they laid the stone for the, the economics of, uh, of the microeconomics of the trade, but they always uh, respected the sovereign. So we shouldn't exaggerate and say that they knew everything in microeconomics that we study today. <laughs> and how can we reconcile their explanation of prices as you just explained, uh, uh, with the prohibition of usury. Oh well, that was that was an influence of Aristotle, among other things, because Aristotle thought that money was uh, that money didn't have any children. As when you have an olive tree, you get the olives, and those can be used, uh, macerated, and so on, and therefore the. Uh, um, the money was sterile. It was used for Aristotle, only used as uh, to uh, to keep your wealth and also to mark the prices. And the idea that you could make money or you could give a service to the economy uh, with money was something that was not accepted by uh, Aristotle. And that was learned by Thomas Aquinas and the other people, the other people were talking and uh, speaking about. So they, they had this, this problem uh, with if you make money financially, you must be sinning. And so you could not, and also is, they said, time is governed by God, which meant that you can die anytime. Time is governed by God, and therefore, how can you charge for time? How can you charge for lending something to? So here they were really still wrong and old, that <clears throat> interest on loans was something that wasn't uh, that was quite fishy. There were some of these economists who understood loans, um, especially Aspil Queta um, and others uh, and other people who were at the University of Paris, not Salamanca, at the University of Paris, and then they, and there was a, the Sorbonne gave a, an opinion that uh, charging for uh, 
the dangers of transporting silver and uh, the, uh, the cost of lending money to a merchant, all that needed or could have a recompense. But uh, there were people called Vittoria who uh, studied in uh, Sorbonne and went back to Salamanca and Vittoria was very much against uh, against interest being charged on loans. And uh, then they had to do all sorts of twists and turns to say, well, this is not interest, this is for the danger of the, danger of the travel, uh, of traveling with, with coins and so on. Uh, yes, they were, they were not uh, advanced enough in matters of finance. Though they understood the finance, they thought it was rather sinful. And uh, that is uh, a sort of, um, well, uh, how could I say, a lack of advance in economic theory. They, they were very good on prices, they weren't good on, on interest. Okay. This was usually forbidden. Well, it is fascinating to see the, the detail in which they were able to identify the sources of revenue for the king at the time. Uh, one of them being the, the over-issue of currency. Can you please tell us uh, something more about this? In, indeed. Well, first, this uh, gentleman, Aspilqueta, in, in 1560, was the first one to say that the amount of money made prices go up and exchanges go down. So uh, he was the one who included uh, the exchange rate and the uh, level of prices within his analysis of what happened when you brought silver from the Indies. Uh, and so, uh, and so he, he, he did that, but he, he, put, he didn't put it in terms of politics. But there was a, a, a friar called Mariana, he was a Jesuit, and in 1609, uh, he saw that the king of, of Spain then, which was, uh, who was uh, Philip IV, uh, ha started issuing, uh, instead of silver money, copper money. Uh, if, you, if you go to Segovia in Spain, you, will have, you can have a look at the factories where copper was pressed uh, by, uh, by uh, machines that worked with the river. And so the, it was easy to press, uh, to press um, sil um, copper coins and to, uh, you added a bit of silver to it and then the copper coins were white and uh, they, uh, people were confused and accepted them in, in, uh, at the beginning like good money. And this gentleman, Mariana, who by the way became famous because he said, uh, you are allowed to kill a tyrant if uh, that tyrant is abusing his power. Uh, Henry IV of France was killed by, um, by somebody who, thought, who hated him, a Catholic who hated him. And so um, uh, since the book came just after the killing of Henry IV, the, the French Inquisition and the universities burnt all the books of Mariana just in case people got ideas. Now Mariana made it, was very clear. What he said is, uh, this inflation is an, a non-permitted tax. It's a tax that the, uh, that, uh, that the court is, that is the parliament of the time, it's a tax that is being laying, laid on people without the permission of the people. And so he he said, the king, Philip III, was abusing his powers by getting income um, for issuing bad money. And uh, this was disliked by the king and his prime minister, and so he was put for the rest of his life in, in, a, in a monastery uh, where he, he was punished for having said, look, inflation is a tax and it's a non-voted a non tax, and the king shouldn't do this sort of thing. So what you had is this school of Salamanca, these friars, they first understood that the price level was influenced by the increase in silver money, then also that the exchange rate 
with Flanders, that is with, Be with Belgium, uh, went against uh, the prices in Seville because in Belgium there was less silver, so prices were low, and in Seville prices were high, you could tra trade with that. And then that it was a political tax, a non-voted political tax. The idea of, of, of uh, the scholastic was that power came from God and then the pe to the people, and then the people confided power in the kings. And, uh, and if they were wrong, you could kill them. Uh, so not only was there an advance in uh, economic analysis of prices, but also there was a, an advance in political economy, in the, in the behavior of the king, who everybody says was an absolute king. He wasn't. Uh, he had to listen to the opinion of the people, certainly. Uh, it was ad moving also into economic policy and moving into political economy. So despite the fact that they didn't uh, understand um, the interest, by the way, the king could pay interest if he, he asked for a loan. And the idea is, if the king decides, then it's all right. But Mariana said no. He said, you are posing, give, laying a tax on us, uh, a tax that we, the Cortes, that is the representatives of the people, haven't voted. And it's wrong. Uh, so there was a, quite a lot of advance in analysis at the time. Uh, including also the international trade. There was a monopoly of trade by the Castilians from Cadiz. But what Vittoria said is, yeah, and said it before the Emperor uh, Charles V in Salamanca, gave a lecture there and told the king, you have no right to conquer the peoples of America. Only if they don't want to trade can you use force to make them trade. That wasn't applied in America. <laughs> it was conquered. But he said that before the king, before the emperor, and the emperor then issued laws to protect the Indians, uh, but those, law, those laws were not very much obeyed at the time. Well, of course, a major event at the time that we've been uh, discussing so far was the significant increase in the, the, the inflow of precious metals, mainly silver, uh, from the New World to Castile. This is something they very much focus on, these, uh, uh, these scholars. Can we consider the, their studies, their findings in monetary economics as, uh, again, as a precursor of um, a, a monetarist explanation of inflation? Well, yeah, uh, absolutely. First, this, uh, this, uh, this man, Aspilcueta, said, now the hands of the people and the goods of the people are giving, costing much more. Since he taught in the south of France, he said prices in, in Salamanca are much higher than in France and it's due uh, to, the, to the silver coming in. And he applied that, as I said, in the confessional. And so he had it very clearly that prices go up. And then, as I said, uh, also the influence of silver on the rate of exchange. Uh, the rate of exchange was very low in Seville. The, the rate was, uh, uh, the money was devalued in Seville because in Flanders, uh, silver was worth much more than in, than in Seville. And then you have the, econ the economic policy of Mr. Mariana saying, this is a tax. But many people today don't understand that inflation is a tax. Uh, he, he knew an unvoted tax, which we know, know uh, here in Britain and also in Spain, all over Europe and all over the world, we have this inflation because too much money is supplied and that makes prices go up and uh, reduces the value of the coin. And that, that's very well known, uh, was very known in, at the time in uh, the second half of the 16th century. And so it is true that there was advance. Look, what I've just told about the effects of inflation uh, on prices, on exchange rate, and as a tax is something that people today don't understand. Well, I couldn't agree more with you. Actually, 
some of, uh, if not the vast majority of the uh, uh, members of the monetary policy committees of various central banks will benefit from reading these scholars. So perhaps absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, will benefit. Yes. Yeah. So well, the train, uh, if I may give another detail of the day, uh, the silver was mined in Peru and also in Mexico, but it came in a in a combination with sulfur. So somehow you had to get the sulfur away and keep the silver. Uh, and that was done in, be in the beginning by heating it. But there were m very few trees then to be cut down and used for the heating. So a discovery, a technological discovery uh, by in, in Spain in, at that time was that if you use mercury, uh, you, you first broke the stones where the silver was, if you use mercury, mercury substituted silver in combination when it was in combination with sulfur. So you broke the, the rocks, you added silver, you added, uh, you added um, mercury and, uh, and also seawater and then the, uh, the silver was freed and you could get it. So this technical advance uh, caused a what we call the Dutch disease today, which is that if a country becomes very productive in an, uh, in a, uh, an activity, then that displaces all their other uh, exports. And they understood that too by, um, by this discovering how to get silver cheaply and without so much, uh, so much trees being felled, then you had this, this situation that we, ha we had in Holland at the time, the Dutch disease being uh, uh, a difficulty in, the, in your balance of trade because you only exported silver, damn it. <laughs> By the way, the, uh, the, the uh, silver, uh, the um, mercury at the beginning, until mercury mines were discovered in Mexico and in Peru, that silver had to be taken from a mine south of Madrid, in Almaden, in little um, uh, leather pouches over in the boats so that they could be used to, to benefit the silver there. So there was a, an especial good which was Spain exported mercury uh, uh, to, to, the, uh, to America. The, the, the way, by the way, the, the silver mines in Mexico were called the, the death mines because silver, uh, um, the, because uh, we know mercury is lethal to people. But so uh, they had to get the, the mercury to be able to get the silver. So, Pedro, we need to, to do a much better job in terms of uh, controlling inflation nowadays, as Absolutely. I suggested. And we are going to suggest your, your, this podcast uh, to some of, um, well, to the vast majority of central banks in the world. So, would you suggest... Um, uh, which authors and, and books, perhaps, would you recommend to start with? Well, I mean, the Marjorie guy starts as the first step that one should have to look at. Then Schumpeter has written a history of economic analysis, and there he again explained how uh, the, the friars, and he names them, as we call Thomas de Mercado and so on, he names them, how, how they had discovered some of the rules of the economy and also the effect on, on prices and what what form prices and so also Schumpeter if you look at the index you can you can see uh, the, on the Salamanca you can see how Schumpeter the, who wrote the history of economic analysis which is something we've all used when we're economists they uh, he understood that and then of course you have you can move on to uh, you can move on to David Hume who again understood that if you had too much uh, supply of money, then prices would go up. In fact, Hume insisted on the balance of trade. When prices go up in England, uh, further than France, then what you have is a movement of gold at that time, at the time of David Hume, to France, so the prices in Britain would fall, in France would go up, and if it was, there was a deficit in 
the, the commercial trade with France that would write itself because of the effect of the increase of money on the exchange rates. That was in Aspilicueta. You had it there in 1590. Uh, and, and therefore, it, it was a, a certainly uh, a step forward. Perfect, uh, Petro. We need to to finish uh, 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 finish here. But uh, well, uh, it's been a, it's been a pleasure to host you today. I really thank you for for joining us today, and thank you all very much for listening. Thank you for listening to me and to Juan Castaneda. Thank you, Petro. Thank you all very much for listening. This podcast is edited by the Vincent Center at the University of Buckingham. You can visit our website at vincentcenter.com to access our podcast series and know more about the programs and events we host, both in Buckingham and in London. Please subscribe to our newsletter if you want to receive timely information on the Vincent Center's agenda.